Um, why should we explore it within our organizations? Why does it matter? I want to share with you our org story about how we came to include mindfulness in our organizational development approach and our talent development approach to answer questions. And, and, and more importantly, there's a couple moments where I want to introduce you to some really simple exercises you can do starting today to help you with this. So here's what I'd like. I have an, an, another poll I'd like to ask, and I'm just curious about, Chris, can you load the poll, uh, the second poll, please? Certainly. Oh, okay. okay. So I'm oh, curious, I'm to, curious know, to know, what is your what experience, is your experience with, mind with mindfulness? <clears throat> so we lo it looks like we have about 80% uh, have voted, and thank you for that. And what's fantastic is, about 40% of you, or about 34% now, are saying, I have no idea, and that's why I'm here today, so welcome. About 60% of you have some familiarity with it, but are looking to maybe deepen your understanding of it and how you can bring it into the workplace. And then about 7% of you are very knowledgeable and practice on a regular basis. I find that a lot of people fall into those, those lower two categories from a standpoint of I have some familiarity. And this, this is a, a, a skill that is gaining a lot of traction. And I'll talk a little bit later about the research that's coming out about the effects of it. And it's becoming a pretty, I jokingly say, it's become a really sexy topic in HR. Um, but there's some real benefit to it. So, so how did AROG, a legal insurance company, start to explore mindfulness? And so we, uh, two years ago, we started focusing on two, two key initiatives. And the first is we started to do some work on our culture. How do we become more intentional about our culture? How do we build on the best of who we are uh, and, 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 and reach towards the goal and the dream of who we want to be? We, we recognize there is an opportunity to help our team members be more bold, to be more kind, to be original, cooperative, and most importantly, to be themselves. We want people to be able to be their authentic selves when they show up. At the same time, as many of you are experiencing, I'm sure, we also had a big focus on wellness. And how do we increase the health of our team members? How do we decrease the stress? And how do we bring all of this together so that we can approach this in a more holistic way instead of a one and done lunch and learn? And so, so we needed our team members to be more intentional both in their health and well-being as well as in their professional work. And mindfulness was one of the ways we began to tackle these issues. And we'll speak a little bit later on how we implemented that. So here's what I'm curious about. How would you define mindfulness? So go ahead and jot down some questions. And Chris, because I'm unable to see the expanded window here, if you could just read off some of the definitions you see emerge. There's no right, There's or, no wrong. right or wrong. There's no right or wrong. Just how do you, interpret, how do you it? interpret it? No problem. I'm on it. So someone is saying being in the moment. Mm -hmm. um, Someone else is saying being present and aware of the moment. Those are the two that I see so far. Paying attention is the third one. Uh, being aware of what is going on around you is the next one. Perfect. Perfect. And, and being intentional is the, the final one I see here. Perfect. 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 There's more. Productivity, active listening in the moment, awareness of yourself, being aware of surroundings, awareness and presence. I see the word presence uh, um, on several ones so far. Experience the present through senses, someone says. Mm -hmm. All right, perfect. All right, Thank, perfect. You. Thank you, Chris. Mm -hmm. Th those are fantastic. Uh, those are fantastic definitions, and each of those uh, touch on pieces of how how we work to define mindfulness and so you've captured a lot of it and what I'd like to do is I'd like us to work today from a common definition you'll see some similarities and some of the things uh, you wrote 
And I will say a number of them spoke to my heart. How do you be more intentional? How do you increase your awareness? How do you pay attention using different senses? So the definition that I work from is the, the definition from John Kabat-Zinn. And John Kabat-Zinn is one of the leading mindfulness experts. He's, he's one of the pioneers in bringing mindfulness into secular practice. And the way that he describes it is paying attention in a particular way on purpose in the present moment and non-judgmentally. And so with mindfulness, we're very focused on what, in, on noticing, on observing what is going on right now. And I think that sometimes there's a misinterpretation that the mindfulness work means that we, we don't, won't, or shouldn't think about the past or the future. So I want to make sure I clarify that and that we won't don't or shouldn't experience pain or joy, but it's just about observing where are we right now and how can we be more purposeful, purposeful about it? Is, is what I'm experiencing right now serving me? And sometimes it isn't, and sometimes we just are okay with that, and other times we need to figure out how we shift out of it. I love breaking down this definition bit by bit because there's so much meat to it if you think about it. So the first is mindfulness is paying attention. And, and that's one of the core practices of mindfulness is to place your focus to something. And that focus could be on your breath. That focus could be driving. It could be something as mundane as washing dishes. It could be focused on your children. It could be focused on your spouse. It could even place your focus on the work that you're doing while you're sitting at your desk. You could be thinking about what kind of thoughts or emotions am I? experiencing. So we're, we're paying attention. We've put something as our center of attention. The next part of it is that it's in this in a particular way. It isn't just that we're paying attention, but we're paying attention in a particular way. And I like to describe this as a compassionate curiosity, that we're curious about what whoa, why did I have that response? Why, why did I have that thought come up in that meeting? Well, oh, that's interesting. Uh, I'm, I, uh, I'm, I'm really worried right now. How can I be compassionate with myself? How can I, when I'm with someone else, um, be curious about where they're coming from, how they're showing up the way they are? And, and that curiosity, we look at what are we noticing? What do we see? What do we smell? What do we feel? What do we hear? And again, I think someone earlier said it's about using those senses. And it's just, again, about deepening our experience in the moment. The next part of it, and this has become one of my mantras, so anyone who has worked with me knows that I will say the word intentional multiple times in a conversation because, again, so much of our lives we spend on autopilot, and we have to because our brain will be able to handle it, but when are those moments where we need to be really intentional? You know, when I do work with leaders, it's how do we lead very intentionally? So this on purpose is how do we become intentional? That it isn't just like, oh, I'm having a great experience and I'm in the moment, but I'm really intentional about being aware right now of who I'm sitting across the table with and what am I noticing about them? What am I noticing about myself? In the present moment is the next piece, and that's something that came up in a lot of the definitions that, that you shared, is just, yeah, right now. What am I noticing right now? You earlier had to do essentially a mindfulness activity, which was just observe where are your thoughts right now. Even if they're in the future or in the past, you're just observing what's happening right now. And the last one, and perhaps the one that is most, I have found in my own practice and as I've worked with other people, this one, this one's the hardest, is non-judgmentally, um, which means no comparison, no judgment, no criticism to yourself or potentially to the people you're with. And it's difficult because we are sort of wired for some judgment. And when I talk about judgment, I don't mean, you know, judgment of safety. Don't walk into a street if you know, cars are coming. That, that's good judgment. Um, but we're talking about that little voice that tells us, you know, we're not good enough, we're not doing this right, or this person is, you know, the limiting beliefs we put on ourselves. And so how do we, how do we let go of some of that judgment to say, wow, I'm feeling kind of sad right now. And that's okay that I feel sad. And let me just explore it. And how can I be compassionate with whatever it is I'm feeling? And so what I'm now what I'm curious about is if you think about this definition, about paying attention in a particular way, on purpose, in the present moment, and non-judgmentally, 
how could these skills impact your organization? And I want you to think about your leadership development, personal development, employee relations, even strategic planning. How might these skills positively impact your organization? And go ahead and just share some of those in the question section. So if somebody so says somebody engaged, said engaged, engaged. I got it, Chris. Got Thank, it, Chris. You. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Better understanding of issues and how to address people's responses or lack thereof to response. And this is an important thing with the work that we do with our team members is how do we shift from reaction to response? How do we create a little bit of space? Um, there's a lot of benefit to and, and outside of just reducing stress, but it uh, and I'll talk a little bit later to expand on that idea more, but there's a lot of benefit of how these different skills can help. You know, think about it from an innovation perspective. Innovation is the result of people being open and curious, being willing to take some risks, being willing to attend to their judgment, to just say, yeah, let's explore that idea, or oh, that's a crazy idea, but let's see where it goes, right? It's how do we get rid of you know, the, the voice that comes out that says, yeah, but we've tried this before, here's a hundred reasons why that won't work, it's critical when we're doing creative, innovative work that we're able to be intentional and let go of some of that judgment and be curious. So, so I can, yeah, yeah. No, I just um, wanted to say something of my own since I can't use the same questions thing. So this is me as a participant, not not me as summarizing anything. But one yeah. Yeah. Um, one area that kind of struck to me is the non-judgmental. Not not only non-judgmental in terms of others, in terms of the quick no, we've never done this this way, therefore it's not going to work. But also non-judgmental about me, about accepting the feelings and the experiences I'm having right at that moment and using myself as a laboratory to basically figure out why I'm having those feelings rather than judging those feelings as inappropriate, out of place, or something that I have to immediately cure. Thank you for that addition and clarification because it's absolutely important that we start with ourselves. And, and when we take time to reflect on, wow, how am I showing up right now? We can get a lot of information. I, I do a lot of work with people who are dealing with crucial conversations or difficult moments. And it's amazing that the data and the facts and the, the information we can gather simply by just taking a moment and going, well, how are you, how are you showing up? You know, so instead of it being, oh, they made me so mad when they sent the email. Well, what was the thought you had? Well, they weren't listening to me. Ah, that's different than they sent me a nasty email. Now we can explore that. And we also have a tendency um, to put some limiting beliefs on ourselves so that, that non-judgmental, that uh, openness can help free us to achieve greater goods. You know, I think that it's important to talk about a couple myths when we talk about mindfulness, and these are things that I've heard in the work that, that I've been doing. And the first one is that, you know, mindful meditation is about stopping your thoughts. So here's my challenge to you. Right now, stop your thoughts. Don't think, uh, in fact, I'll, I'll add a challenge. Don't think about a purple cow with green spots. And I, I, I'm sure if we all raised our hands, all of us thought about that purple cow with green spots, that we weren't able to stop our thoughts. We can't. We can't stop our thoughts. We have, on average, 60 to 70,000 thoughts a day. And so I love this analogy of a snow globe, that if you think about each, each little individual pieces of snow are the thoughts that we have. And sometimes it's shooken up so hard, and you know things are frantic, and they're coming at us in, in so many different ways that we just can't get clarity. And the idea is by taking a moment, placing our focus, being intentional and aware, and in the moment, it just allows those thoughts to settle. It doesn't mean the thoughts go away. It just means they settle a little bit so they aren't clouding our vision anymore. And I love thinking about that. In fact, sometimes 
for myself. I'm like, oh, my, my snow globe is really shooken up today. And it's just a good trigger for me to realize, okay, how do I settle some of those thoughts and engage with them differently? And again, it's noticing that they're still there. We still get to see the snow pieces falling. We're just engaging with them differently. You know, another myth that I hear is people will say, well, I just, I don't have any time. And the beautiful thing about this is you can practice this in a variety of different ways. And it could be as simple as one breath, just breathing in and then breathing out. Just one moment, just one simple breath is all it takes to help activate uh, our parasympathetic nervous system to calm it down and to just gain our, our focus. Um, other people will say, well, I just don't have quiet space. I have kids or I work in a noisy office. Sometimes my favorite places to, to practice mindfulness is, is amongst the chaos. And to just sit there and to see, what am I all hearing? What are all the noises that are going on? What's all the activity? What am, I, what am I sensing right now? Another one that I hear frequently is that, well, don't you need years and years of practice for it to gain any benefit? And, you know, while certainly people who have been practicing for decades have a hand up on those of us who have just started, you know, in the last couple of years or just starting today, but what research shows is that our brains begin to change uh, in a very positive way in as little as six to eight weeks of practicing. And I'm not talking sitting for hours or two hours a day, just 10 minutes, 10, 20 minutes a day of just finding moments where you're being intentional and focused and being aware of the present moment. And then the last one I think is important is that while mindfulness has its roots in non-secular faiths, in uh, various religious um, beliefs, the, the mindfulness that I'm talking about and, and what has really created this movement is, is not a, about a religion. Uh, it's, it's about a, a mental training. It's about being able to develop our brain in a way to slow it down a little bit, to get clarity, to be able to, again, respond and not react. And, you know, I think it's, it's fair to share with you how I came to mindfulness from a personal journey perspective, and I'm very open with this story. About three years ago, I began having panic attacks out of nowhere. And if any one of you in the audience who knows somebody or who has experienced panic attacks, you know that they're not enjoyable and they're not, <laughs> they're terrible. And, you know, there's, I think the doctor described it as it's a sense of impending doom, right? That, that, that there's this, sometimes it can get so severe that you actually think you're dying even though there's no logical reason that you would be. And so I was diagnosed with panic disorder and as somebody who makes their living speaking in front of groups, uh, teaching, facilitating, and being in front of uh, an audience for most of her job, that was a pretty terrifying proposition to be faced with. That at any moment, my body might go into this fight or flight mode of something's not right. And so for me, one of the ways that I was able to successfully manage my panic and get to a place where I have a different relationship with it was through uh, mindfulness and, and I and I taught myself and I read a lot of books and I reached out to people and that combined with just really good therapy and no medicine I've been able to really manage that panic to a point where yeah, every once in a while it ripples up a little bit but not in the same way in fact when I talk with people about it they'll share their stories and they'll say how did you cure it I'm like, I didn't cure it I just have a different relationship with it now and so for me on a very personal level it has really settled those snowflakes. Um, it's settled those, those ideas, and it's allowed me to have greater clarity and calmness in my life. And I'm, I'm always, I always love hearing from other people and their stories. So if you ever want to open up or share, feel free to reach out to me afterwards. Um, I think it's something important for us to talk about. This is my little soapbox. Mental health issues are out there, and we need to be willing to talk about it. Okay, so now... Here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to invite you in a really simple mindfulness practice. This is a, an easy exercise that you can do nearly everywhere, not while you're driving. And I'm, I will ask you that no matter where you're at, so many of you are probably sitting at your desk, I'd like to invite you to close your eyes. And the reason I'm inviting you to close your eyes is because when we close our eyes, it makes it easier for us to focus and observe ourselves. 
and don't worry. And if you notice thoughts emerge about, oh, what are my coworkers going to think? What, you know, just, just acknowledge that those thoughts are there and then see if you can just shift back to our place of focus. So our place of focus will just simply be on our breath. And I'd like to invite you to just observe what your body does when it breathes in. So take a deep breath and then breathe out. And then just continue to breathe normally. And I want you to notice what do you notice physically about the body as it moves up and down? What thoughts are you having right now? Not good or bad, we're just observing. What emotions might you be experiencing right now? And what are some of those physical sensations? So let's take the next 30 seconds to just observe this, this moment and just focusing on the breath. And every time the mind wanders, just acknowledge it. And say, oh, there you go, mind, and bring it back to the focus on the breath. Perfect. And what I'd like you to do as we finish up is I want you to take a moment to congratulate yourself for giving, your, giving you yourself this time. So give yourself a little metaphorical pat on the back. So here's what I'm curious about. We just took a minute to just place our focus somewhere else. And I would be curious to hear from you, what was this experience like? What, what, did, you, what did you notice as you you paid attention to yourself. And go ahead and just jump in the question section and share with us some of the thoughts you have. Became less cold. Relaxation that came over me. Call me. It was very calming. The breathing slowed down. I noticed different body parts. Yeah, that's what's fantastic, is suddenly when you pay attention, you notice stuff you just didn't notice. Perfect. So again, really simple exercise. This is just, I, I call this a mindful minute. And you just set up a minute. Doesn't even have to be a minute. Could just be a couple of breaths. This is a perfect exercise that we teach our team members that they can do at their desks. You can go find a room. You could go for a walk. Um, and again, it could just be one simple breath mindfully. And what's, what's fascinating is actually it's a, our body's having a physiological response when we, when we focus and when we um, focus on our breathing in particular, that it, it, deep breathing uh, offsets. So when we're stressed, our sympathetic nervous system goes nuts and says, freak out. And when we start breathing uh, physiologically, we are calming down a specific nerve called the vagus nerve that is kicking off our parasympathetic nervous system. This is me getting a little geeky here. And it's actually kicking off chemicals to calm us down. So I'm curious, um, this, and it's interesting, I want to be able to see you guys, but how many of you, just by a show of hands, um, how many of you regularly give yourself this kind of time? And maybe just you know, raise your hand or drop a note. Um, And I'm trying to see Chris. I don't know if I can see the hand. Oh, there they are. Okay. So, so not, not, not a lot of you, you know, one or two of you. And this is really common. We, we are moving so fast. We're trying to get so much stuff done. We're trying to be everything to everyone, both at work and at home and to ourselves, that we forget to take time to recharge ourselves. So this sense of calm you experience in just as little as a minute, I want you to keep this with you. Again, this is something, don't do it while you're driving, although you can drive mindfully. Um, 
is a really simple exercise you can do. I know when I have a, a big presentation or if I have uh, some stressful situations going on, I just take a minute and to just focus and calm down that snow globe a little bit. Or I go for a minute walk where I'm just very mindful about how I move and, and walk through. And one of the things that's important for us to, to realize is that a couple of things happen. When we observe our thoughts and our emotions and our sensations, they typically, not always, but typically will naturally dissipate a little bit. And part of that is because of the, the parts of the brains we're activating. So when we're in full emotional mode, our amygdala is firing, and when we start to label things and go, oh, that's worry, oh, that's planning, oh, that's joy, um, the, a different part of our brain gets activated, which kicks in our logic. Right? So there's a lot of interesting brain science here. The other thing to remember is that we, our emotional responses and our thought responses are similar to a muscle memory. Right? I'm sure all of us have situations where we will respond in sort of the same way and the same intensity. And by observing that, we can start to become aware of what's that habit that I have and do I want that to be my habit? Right? This is that term neuroplasticity that you're hearing a lot in the last couple of years. The brain science in the last 10 years has just increased dramatically because of the technology that's available. And so we can literally rewire our brain. And that's, in fact, what they find happens when people are practicing mindfulness is different parts of the brains are getting activated that are decreasing stress and opening up, um, creating a more openness and curiosity. So. Let's talk about how you can practice mindfulness. So the one minute um, exercise I just taught you is what I would consider a formal practice. There's formal practices and informal practices. Formal practices include longer periods of what I would call meditative or contemplative practices. This might be where you're sitting, you're standing, you're walking, you might be lying down. There's some really great um, meditative concentrative exercises you can do before bed to help you settle a little bit. And again, it's about placing your focus and noticing every time that your mind drifts and bringing it back to that focus. And, and I always tell people, think about it like a rep. Like if you are lifting weights and you're doing a rep, every time you notice your mind wander and you bring it back, that's a rep. You are training your brain to have increased concentration. And some people will say, uh, you know, when they start learning this, <laughs> they'll They'll say, oh, I'm just not getting good at this meditation. And the thing that's important is it's not about getting better about the meditation, but it's about using the meditation to practice being in the moment by paying attention, by being compassionate, to be curious so you could be better in life. Every time that you notice your mind wander, every time you make an observation about something that's happening, you are strengthening and training your brain so you can do that more readily in the future. Now, in informal ways, it's just finding those little moments to shift out of autopilot, you know, savoring a really great piece of chocolate. If you're connecting with a friend or family member and you're just so in the moment, and you just for a brief second just look at them and appreciate what, they, what they're bringing to the table or even just taking a breath mindfully. So I'm curious to know what was a time when you were fully in the moment? When, when was a time recently, if you think about it from an informal perspective, that you were, you were just very in the moment noticing what was going on? And I would, somebody wrote, never. Um, so, so when was the time for you? I just, my husband and I just recently moved and we're in the process of unpacking. And there were just a couple moments where I just found myself, wow, this is, amazing that this is our house. Um, somebody was listening to a musical performance that was really moving. Music is a great way to help uh, focus our brain. That's a great technique to use. Um, my husband playing the guitar app on his phone. I love that. Spending time with family and sitting back to take it all in. These are fantastic descriptions, right? Um, so again, meditation. Uh, oh, someone else wrote, uh, stopped at a stoplight overlooking the river. It's amazing what we miss out on when we're moving so fast and we don't take time to just appreciate it. And again, I'm not saying that we need to live every moment of the day like this, but just finding those moments where we can just stop and go, that's really cool, I'm really curious. Uh, somebody mentioned experiencing back pain. It wasn't pleasant, but it's part of life. Yep, mindfulness isn't just about experiencing the joy, it's about experiencing the, the difficulties and the pain. 
um, somebody had a discussion with their daughter who they hadn't talked to in a while, and I made myself stop and enjoy the moment. This, these are really, really lovely and giving me goosebumps. So I love this. So it's how do we cultivate more, than, more of these moments? Um, I've also, on the handout you have, I listed a number of, of, of resources you can refer to. There are great books that are out there. There's great apps that you can download to help with some of this work. And so let's talk just real briefly about the mindful research. Consistently, and, and research on mindfulness has increased something ridiculous, like 15, 1,500%. But the things that I think are most important for us, especially from an HR perspective, is we know that stress impacts not only our, our health cost, but it also decreases productivity, it decreases our creativity, and mindfulness has been consistently proven to reduce our stress. It reduces rumination, so that worrying about stuff. The increased focus, which increases our productivity, our cognitive flexibility, where we're able to shift between um, and consider new possibilities. So when you look at these researches, this is really important stuff for the work that we're trying to do. So what, what did we do at ROG? We started with offering a four-week mindfulness workshop and where we ex explored in a very formal way and labeling it, teaching people different exercises. In the handout you have, I did provide the key topic areas we explored in each of those four weeks. And again, and I am happy to share information with anyone who's interested in it. There's some, really, again, really great resources. Um, we've also created a personal leadership workshop, which really puts the focus on how you show up and how that impacts the work you do and the people you work around. And we've combined these two workshops, and next year we will be rolling out a three-month program um, focused on increasing our team members' ability to become more self-aware so that they can more regulate. We've also found ways to incorporate them into our leadership competencies. We've just rolled out our leadership competencies, and, and one of our, our main ones is we, we're, we call it, lovingly we call it, be better. And be better is just about increasing your self-awareness. So again, you can... Be intentional about how are you showing up and is it being productive right now. We have a series of programs we'll be rolling out next year, but one of the challenges I think that's common is, especially with us, we're 165 uh, team members, is we can't just be offering classes all the time. We have work, work that needs to be done, not to mention us as HR professionals. We have lots of different hats we're wearing. So for us, it's how do we, how do we include aspects of helping people be more curious, helping them be more in the moment, being increased in their self-awareness. And so from an informal perspective, we've, we've increased the amount of team member coaching that we do, and we're including those mindful practices within it, even if we don't call it mindfulness. We've created a deck of mindful moment cards, which again, if you're interested, I'm happy to share with you. And they're just little moments, little things for people to think about related to our culture. So when we talk about being kind, what's a thought, what's a quote that somebody can reflect on. Another thing that I think is fun that we've started to do is just in incorporating random acts of play. How do we have random moments to help people, again, develop that sense of curiosity? A couple weeks ago, we brought in a balloon artist. and We didn't tell anyone. He just showed up. And he just kept track of how many people People engaged with him and asked him to build stuff and he kept track of how many people were cynical and kept moving and said this was you know dumb we didn't have as many of those but just how can we keep giving people opportunities to practice being more curious and, and, and non-judgmental I wanted to share with you some of the results that we found from the workshop that we led um, through our mindfulness workshop um, we we consistently across the board saw a pretty significant shift in a couple of the areas that we measured. We, uh, we had 90% of participants um, report an increased awareness of stress, so they became more aware of how they were holding stress, how stress was showing up on their life. We had 100% of our participants have a positive shifting from autopilot to being in the moment. We had 80% report a decrease in stress. And the one that I love is we had 100% of people um, share that they've experienced an increase of appreciation of coworkers. What's interesting about these stats is that um, in some cases, the, the, the stats after the fact, the, if you compare the before the workshop to after, actually decrease. And upon talking with those people, they, they've they realized that before they took the workshop, they thought they had a better sense of self-awareness. They had a better sense of what the stress was in their life. And they realized through doing this work that actually, no, they didn't. And they had a lot of work to do. So I thought that was really interesting. 
So these are just our own anecdotal information. So what I want to share with you is just some things to consider as you're considering implementing these in your, your organization. And the first is you need to meet the audience where, they're, where they are. And what I mean by that is um, there's a lot of zealots in all areas and there's a lot of people I'm very passionate about mindfulness, and I'm one of them, but I recognize that certain terminology has a time and place, the way I present the information and how I present it. There are some people in the organization I'm very much more focused on sharing. Here's the research and the science behind it. And for other people, I might tap in more to the, um, the, the improvement of one's sense of meaningfulness in, in life. Um, some people, I don't call it meditation. I may call it a concentration exercise. And it doesn't really matter what, what you call it or what, how you present it, but it's being really thoughtful about who's your audience, where are they at, and what makes sense for what your organization needs. The next one is that mindfulness is really best served with experience. I cannot give you that which I do not have. And so it was imperative, from my experience, um, that it's imp this isn't something you can just read a book or you shouldn't just read a book and go do, but this is a way of living. It's a way of um, being with people, and if you're not modeling it, then people uh, will be less likely to trust the process. So it's important that if you do decide to take this on and to facilitate it yourself, that you really start genuinely and intentionally practicing this. The third bullet is kind of strange, but I always recommend to people do it for the right reasons. Don't do it because it's a sexy topic and you're seeing it everywhere and all the cool companies in Silicon Valley are doing it. You have to do it because it's right for your organization and it's possible that it might not be a fit. And so really listen to what are the needs of your organization, what are you trying to accomplish, and if this is a tool that you can use for it, then by all means do it. And then like any any kind of skill building, any kind of change that you're working to create, you have to be patient and let the program breathe. Um, let it, um, you can't force it down people's mouth, you know, you can't force it down them. You can't, can't coach the, uncoach or the unwilling, right? And so it's really important to, you know, think about it. We, we look at it as like we plant seeds. And so we do a little bit over here that's a, a little bit more formal. Over here we're a little bit more informal. And I would say where we're at now as a company, the kind of work we're able to do, the kind of conversations we're able to have, we weren't ready to have those conversations three years ago. We weren't ready to, we weren't in a place where that aligned with what our culture is. And so it's important to just take your time and be okay that not everyone's going to fall in love with this. Um, and that's okay. Everyone's on their own journey. So one of the last... Um, tools I would like to leave you with is a really simple approach called the stop method. And this is something you can do in the moment. It's to just periodically stop, take a breath, which I haven't really done in the last 20 minutes. Take a breath, observe what's going on, and then proceed and decide if how you're feeling, what you're observing right now is being productive or not. So a really simple tool. And then I'd like to leave you with one of my favorite quotes and one that has been a, a, uh, a part of our foundational practices here. And that is, between stimulus and response, there is a space. And in that space is our power to show our response. And in our response lies our growth and our freedom. And so what, what I hope you've taken from this is the value of taking a moment, of taking a pause, to create a little bit of space so that you can respond versus reacting. So with that, I would love to open it up to any questions you might have or things you are curious about or you're observing right now. So uh, I'll ask you to share those in the questions section. And uh, I will, uh, Chris, if you can help me out here, that would be fantastic. Sarah, yeah, um, I'm monitoring the questions, and I have one as they're coming in. And mine is, when you first started talking about meaningfulness at ARAG, was there any pushback, any, any people saying, oh, that's too touchy-feely, and if so, how did you deal with it? Perfect. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Yes and yes. <laughs> there were. Um, so, again, I... 
I knew that for some audiences, I needed to come from a scientific perspective. Uh, so in, in some cases, I presented the facts, the stats, the science. Here's what happens to our brain. Here's how it's going to help our bottom line, or here's how it's going to help our team members be better. Uh, you know, I would say that I, I didn't personally experience anyone who was directly contradictory or was aggressive about it. I think that one of the challenges I had was helping people see that mindfulness can benefit anyone and not just people who might be struggling with anxiety or things like that. One of my leaders I remember asking, well, who really, you know, like who should be doing mindfulness? Like, I don't really, <laughs> like, he didn't say I don't need it, but I mean his question was just, uh, his perspective was it wasn't for everybody. And so one of the things that helped me tremendously and, and helped this work is that Erin um, Barfels, who's our chief HR officer, um, she had just recently um, received her coaching certification and also had a great deal of experience with it. And so between the two of us, we were able to, to tackle our audiences. But again, um, there's a lot of really fascinating research. Uh, Search Inside Yourself is the program that Google created and was created from an engineer. And so there's a lot of great information to present it in a way that doesn't, that can um, dispel some of those people who feel it's too touchy-feely. Great question. What else? I'm seeing here, how did you create buy-in with the senior team? And what has your biggest learning as you have implemented this program? Yeah, so we were, um, because we were, putting a strategic focus on defining our culture. And a number of things that came out of that was team members helped us define those cultures as we, we as a company made a concerted effort to say, when our team members are at our, their best, we will be at our best. And so we were able to tie it really directly. The skills we were wanting to help people develop, we were able to tie it very directly back to the kind of culture that was being defined, the, the work that they needed to see people. There's, like every company, we're trying to be more innovative. So connecting it back to what's our strategic plan um, and how, how will these skills help people get there. And the, again, I had a couple of really great champions, which helped. Um, I would say that we're still working on shifting leadership from a place of support to modeling it. Um, so that, I think, has been one of the ahas that I've had is because I've had, it was such a profound effect on me, I've had to be very patient in an understanding that everyone's on their own journey with this. And for some people, this isn't going to be a tool they, they use, and I have to be willing to be okay with that. And so that was, that's taken some time for me to settle down a little bit and not be as eager. I think the other thing is, I think oftentimes it's easy to get for people, especially in leadership, to support initiatives and to support development and say, yes, we need to do this, um, but not always recognize the role they need to play in modeling it. So that's, that's what I continue to explore is how can I help close that gap. What else? I think we probably should wrap up. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. Yes. Yes. Well, so, well, so with that, with I'd like to thank you for your attention today. And if you have any other questions, please do not hesitate to contact me. This is something I'm very passionate about. I'd love to see uh, more companies, especially in the Midwest, starting to, to explore it and consider it. I've got the mindful leadership. I'm speaking at more conferences because of it. And so I... I'm happy to share with you whatever resources I have. So thank you, and I hope that after today you don't forget to breathe. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Chris.